So welcome everybody. This afternoon we're going to focus on the Mediterranean and particularly the regional plan of action for the Gale Fisheries, which is a novel and unique fisheries instrument which was launched in 2018 by the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean and Axel, which is the regional fisheries body responsible for management in those two regions. Um, why do we need a regional plan of action? Well, the full scale fisheries is particularly important in the Mediterranean, historically, culturally, and actually, in terms of strength in numbers, 80% of the fleet by vessel number, 44% of the fishing capacity, 60% of the employment, and 24% of the land and value, and critically important for food security and livelihoods. So the GFCM, which is the regional fishing management body, uh, has been going on for some time, and the gestation period for this instrument, if you like, goes back to 2013, again in Malta, when there was first regional symposium on sustainable small scale fisheries in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. And this called on the member states of the GFCM to define national practice fisheries, indicating in particular the basic small scale fisheries. This initiative came together with an initiative from the European Commission, who for many years have not been successful in extending the common fisheries policy to the Mediterranean. So in 2016, there was a big effort to embed the common fisheries policy in the Mediterranean. First of all, through a process which is called the Tanya Project, which is to bring the fisheries science and back to the stocks to the fishing sector and the policy makers to bring these acts together and uh, to launch an initiative which was called Med Fish Forever. So it was through the Med Fish Forever that the European Commission, in consultation with the GFCM, came up with the idea of a regional plan of action for small scale fisheries. Not just about fisheries management, but it's also about food security and the social and economic dimension of small scale fisheries. But also observing that small scale fisheries are very much on the periphery when it comes to fisheries management. So the idea that they should be more central, that there will be a need for capacity building, a need for training on both sides. There were many things to address. So this regional plan of action brought all of these together in 2018 was signed up to by 18 member states of the Mediterranean together with the European Union. And around this time, uh, an eclectic group called the Friends of Small Scale Fisheries, which is a group of observers who participate in the regional plan of action. Um, they formed this group called Friends of Small Scale Fisheries because they wanted to ensure that this momentum based on happening in the sack. So we have very little in common with each other other than our interests and our passion for small scale fisheries and uh, a, um, a, uh, a priority to ensure that this goes forward. So this afternoon you will hear from various of my colleagues I introduced them uh, one by one who are members of this Friends of Small Scale Fisheries within the um, TFCM. We're observing, we're recognized as a group, and we have hours every day, like organized workshops and um, organized training through the uh, forum, put them over the floor, and so on, taking notes. So uh, we have some time within the TFCM, although we don't have a role. So without more ado, I'd like to call on Constance Merlat. We were speaking just now. Constance is a small scale fisheries specialist at the OPM, 
Yeah, welcome consoles. I think you all are there on the screen. Just uh, please go ahead. So, as my work was mentioned, um, I'll be presenting a paper on the new event of the Mediterranean. Uh, what is the other way of success? We can a deeper dive into the Mediterranean strategy while the internet is still getting ongoing. So, we first. So one of the main roles of this platform is to ensure the implementation of the regional kind of action for the platform along with the uh, staff, and here you have the different actors the GFPM, uh, like WWF, MEDAC, MEDCAN, uh, MedCAN, CM, and BISAC. And we'll have different uh, contributions from the different uh, center of staff today. So, I already mentioned briefly uh, just before what the GFCM is the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean. Uh, which is the regional fisheries management organization for the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, uh, has 23 contracting parties, including the EU, with the objective to ensure conservation uh, and sustainable use of marine resources in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. Do you mind just see that? Just a little bit. Yeah. I'll try. You have to project. <laughs> Uh, and so the GFCM has a very important role uh, in fisheries governance. Uh, uh, with the authority to adopt binding recommendations for fisheries conservation. So uh, countries in the region are binded, let's say, to implement those recommendations uh, at national level. So um, a brief overview of SSF that was already mentioned by Brian with more or less similar numbers, but uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, SSF represents 83% of the fleet uh, in the Mediterranean, 29% of revenue, 15% um, of catch, and 57% uh, of um, onboard vessel employment. So it has a very important role in the region uh, in providing um, a healthy source of protein, uh, supporting livelihoods in the, in, the, in the region. But on the other side, as I also mentioned before, the sector is quite poor in data, uh, so it hinders its consider its consideration in decision making processes. So um, there is work to do, but initiatives have been implemented, also in line with uh, provisions of the RPOA SSF. Uh, so I'll be also presenting some of uh, these actions. Uh, first. At national level, the, the international instrument uh, that was also talked about right before, the SSF guidelines, which is the main international instrument that specifically focuses on small-scale fisheries um, that was negotiated uh, in 2014, and it brings together human rights, social development, responsible fisheries, focusing specifically on small-scale fisheries. And it also implements other uh, international um, instruments, for example, the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. So this is at international level, um, and uh, it recommends how to secure sustainable fisheries uh, at economic level, socially, ecologically, so has a cross-cutting theme again, uh, to empower fishing communities to be part of discussions and uh, to be part of the decisions and to have uh, so that they have a say, both women and men uh, in the uh, indigenous groups and marginalized groups. And so at regional level, we have this uh, RPOA SSF, the Regional Plan of Action for Small Scale Fisheries, um, which Brian already presented, but uh, uh, it was based on conclusion from regional conferences that took place prior um, and with the specific reference to the SSF guidelines. So the RPOA SSF is the main instrument at a regional level in the Mediterranean that uh, aims at implementing the SSF guidelines, also tailored to the specificity of the region. 
uh, so it was signed in 2018, and it is a 10 year roadmap of uh, actions to be implemented. So over 10 years, um, uh, to with nine different topics, which I'll go deeper uh, uh, in the next slides. So here you have the nine main areas of action of the uh, RKOA SSF with scientific research, data collection and management measures that are specific to SSF, value chain, the participatory approach, capacity building, decent work in social protection, um, the role of women and climate in the environment. So going deeper into each topic and different examples of actions to take for uh, each of these areas, of starting with um, scientific research, uh, which is crucial to understand the environment and the impacts of the sector. Um, so this is why research is encouraged in particular uh, socioeconomic research, which have and is impacted by, well, it, which has an important impact on SSF um, and also the interactions of SSF with the marine environment. With data collection, um, there have been new participatory data collection systems that have been uh, implemented to better involve the SSF sector in collecting data because they are the main actors and so we can get the best information from them directly. Um, and uh, developing this participatory approach in different areas of um, fishing. So with management measures, um, the RPOA SSF aims at implementing access rights, for example, access to resources, to landing sites, um, also focusing on biodiversity preservation, for example, by minimizing bycatch, uh, also focusing on technology, um, to have better navigation equipment uh, and also uh, developing monitoring control and surveillance measures specific to uh, the SSF sector. And then we have a uh, value chain. Um, so for value chain, the SSF, uh, the RPOA SSF provides for actions targeting uh, the strengthening of producer organizations including through improving market access, the promotion of shorter value chains uh, and raising consumer awareness on certification and traceability. Uh, the RPOA SSF also focuses on um, participation of SSF in the decision-making process um, through co-management practices, which we'll talk about a little after in the session and the uh, management of marine protected areas, also marine spatial planning uh, processes. And then there are actions for capacity building, which is also kind of an overarching theme because capacity building will go for all of the areas of action uh, by creating platforms of SSF organizations, uh, promoting access to funding, to training, and also providing technical assistance. And then, with the three last topics, uh, with the promotion of decent work, um, the RPOA SSF provides for actions to improve working condition, uh, conditions and to make sure that social protection is um, open to all fishers uh, and small scale fisheries workers in particular. Uh, women also play a crucial role. So the RPOA SSF aims at strengthening their role and their voices um, with projects dedicated to enabling them to undertake activities and to secure their equal participation. And finally, the climate uh, and the environment, which are major factors to be considered now uh, as coastal communities are quite affected by climate change, by marine pollution. Um, so this is why the RPOA SSF provides for action to support these communities and face uh, climate change and, for example, with initiatives to dispose of marine litter to uh, recycle uh, recovered nets. So we have here the different steps kind of um, of the implementation of the RPOA SSF with all the friends of SSF uh, that have been working on this, uh, which so the RPOA SSF was launched in 2018 and consultations were organized uh, following the adoption of the RPOA SSF with stakeholders to assess priority actions for SSF for the sector. 
Um, and based on this, in 2018, the RPOASSF monitoring framework was um, adopted with a series of um, baseline information to start the, to assess where the sector is now and where the prog progress needs to be made. So with this framework, a, qu a questionnaire was circulated to the different GFCM members and the results were communicated in 2020 in the SOMPI publication, so the State of Mediterranean Fisheries that was launched by the GFCM, well, that was uh, launched by the GFCM in 2020. And so now there has been a new assessment that has been ongoing uh, with using this monitoring framework as the base um, to now understand where things that are at now in 2022. So a similar questionnaire has been sent to countries and we hope to be able to um, publish the results in the next donkey publication that should be um, finalized by December 2022. Um, and here you have also the SSF forum, which is um, a series of workshops, I'll talk about it right after, um, that also helps in the implementation of the RPOASF to help build capacity for fishers and fish workers, and to also understand and hear from them their own uh, experience their own practices and to build upon these exchanges and, and continue the work. So now where are things uh, with the implementation of the RPOASSF? So based on the first results that we had from the first round of questionnaire in 2020, um, priority actions are summed up here in a few sentences, of course. Um, with need effort needed to strengthen engagement with SSF and to have a strengthened dialogue, let's say, with with the sector, so that we also hear from them and they don't just don't don't just hear from us uh, with the with the different stakeholders and to reinforce the links with these actors in the region. Also, to hold more consultations with the stakeholders um, to better assess the needs, so that we actually have action that is specific to the sector and um, tailored to what they actually say. Then also um, providing increased opportunities for SSF organizations to participate in GFCM events, for example, the SSF forum, which was launched and um, it would be great to have more participation of fishers, but it's also on us to communicate about it and make sure we have strengthen links with actors who would be interested in participating in such events. And then finally, to ensure engagement uh, work reaches also women and also younger fishers. So the SSF Forum, which I mentioned uh, just before, finally, uh, the SSF Forum is uh, designed for small scale fishers and fish workers. Uh, from the Mediterranean and the Black Sea to come together, to share good practices, to share their experience so that they can learn also from one another, but that we can also learn from them. So the idea is to encourage the exchanges between different fishing communities from different countries in the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean and to promote the sharing of the practices. So for example, we've had workshops on data collection, on co-management, on innovation techniques, um, coping with climate change, for example. And so this initiative was uh, launched in 2020. And of course, with COVID, we've had to adapt to online uh, workshops, which wasn't the best. Um, I mean, we had to adapt, but the ideal is also to have this in-person uh, events and that we can really connect because online, because it makes it a little bit complicated. But uh, this year and next year, we're also aiming to have more of these events in person. Um, so that uh, we can organize exchanges with, between different communities, et cetera. So this year, uh, this year's program has around nine or 10 workshops already, a few were already organized and they were centered around uh, two main themes, the stakeholder policy interface uh, and the next generation of SSF. So for the stakeholder policy interface, the workshops uh, seek to shed light on decision-making processes, how, we go from data collection to adopting decisions um, and to make sure that, um, and how we go to adopting management measures and to make sure the management measures are in line with the data that was collected. And then the workshops on the next generation of SSF. 
um, uh, seek to provide young people with tools to succeed and to um, get engaged in the SSF sector. Finally, my very last note is today we will talk about co-management and gender equity. And so I just wanted to highlight that this uh, gender equity as a part of the workshop will be part of a series of webinars, Women and a Changing Tide, How to Break the Bias, uh, to acknowledge the role of women, the, the, um, they, the, the challenges they face uh, need to be considered uh, in management to ensure a gender-based approach. And for this, um, we build upon these four pillars, equal voice and decision-making power, equal rights uh, and access and control over resources, equal rights and access to services, decent work, and reduction of women's work burdens. That's it for me. Um, I'll turn back to you. Thank you very much. So we're just changing over. I'll just introduce our next speaker, Martha Hamaday, lives of Mediterranean coordinator of marine biologists and passionate about small scale fisheries and about the importance of engaging directly with the fishes and bringing them into the market, into the decision making process as the market. Mark is going to talk to us about the role of small scale fishers in the value chain, how they can move from being price makers to price makers, and to talk specifically about the food next project. Which partner is one of the teams of our partners in the department? So, with you, thanks very much for coming. We move from the center online to the center. Okay, I have to warn you, I have a soft voice, so please let me know if you don't hear me. I know that I tend to do that. Thank you for the presentation, Brian. So Yes, yeah, so from price takers to price makers, this is a bit the idea behind. Um, how do I switch? Just turn. No. In here. No. Okay. So, so you can just press one like that. Okay. So just refreshing what um, Constance was saying on the RPOA. Uh, this is an initiative focused on the small scale fisheries value chain, and it actually talked about the three points that uh, were taking care in the RTO. So it's kind of really addressing um, the value chain issues on multiple fisheries. I'm going to put you to Food Connected, um, which is an initiative that is not just from life, it's a partnership initiative uh, from Slow Food, Global Food Network, Cominorca, well, all these partners that you see here. Um, they are not all only on small scale, actually, I think it's the only one addressing the fishery, but also um, addressing also with farmers and so on, because this is a, a food centered initiative, not only on, on fisheries. Um, well, we all know the, the, the problems no, that we are facing as small scale fisheries and how this tends to have a vicious circle um, uh, uh, consequences in, 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 in the value chain. And so some other important premises that we thought when we were trying to propose this initiative was that actually challenges and solutions from the small producers, also from land, not only from fisheries, are quite similar. And actually the audience and the, the consumers of those products would be maybe the same. So we had to talk to each other with small farmers, uh, uh, small producers that uh, have cattle, et cetera, and see how we can engage together in this um, same approach. No? Also, we need to address the food systems, not only from production systems, but how this all goes to the consumption, um, to transportation, et cetera, all through the value chain. And we have to see it as a, as a holistically, not only from production to the consumption, but all in general. Also, we thought that the terminology when we talk about sustainability and so on was very much addressed to the environmental part, but we needed somehow to also integrate more holistically the views of the social component, the economic component, um, the governance component, and so on. Into so we can really have this uh, uh, 
differentiation really uh, key. No? We want that consumers and producers are actors of change direct in their own rights. Because if the producers are not actors of change or the consumers are not actors of change, change won't happen really. It was going to be quite fake and it won't have sustainability in the time. So this is also key for us. We wanted to promote this community spirit um, to help one another instead of compete and um, work isolated from one another. We want farmers to talk to fishers. <laughs> we want um, restaurants to talk to the producers, etc. And somehow we have in this imagination, if we talk about now imagining and so on, um, we wanted to go towards um, an affordable, participatory, small-scale fisheries warranty system, a PGS. So what's a PGS? I, I won't spend a lot of time in here in this, but somehow um, this definition was inspiring for us. Um, this was a, a came, the, the PGS came with the professional, professionalization of the organic sector, actually in land from farmers, where there was a lot of um, small holders uh, getting to go organic. And all the issues that we saw that happened to the organic small holders were happening to us also in small scale fisheries. And we thought, no, and they say um, that it's a complementary, low cost, locally based system of quality and assurance, difference from the third party certification schemes, that they have more emphasis on the social control and knowledge building, and that they are more adapted for small holders who actually are the more benefit tenants for the organic. Uh, and they faced a lot of bar barriers to the third party certification for the cost that would take, the paperwork, etc. So that was talking to us. This was and we thought that there was a very similar um, no, a scenario of, of us on small scale fisheries, and we thought we would explore this a bit more. So, what is FoodNet? That is not a participatory anti system scheme, <laughs> but we wanted to address a bit some issues there. No? Actually, it's a network of communities of practice. Uh, so, actually, it's an organized group of small producers and other key actors in the, in the food system who share values uh, on, and focus on sustainability. And together we transform the current food systems into a fairer more sustainable food system uh, for a healthy planet and resilient communities. So actually it's actually people uh, on the value chain with direct connections that try to address uh, things together um, and share values. Uh, what Funnected will do, but first it will at the stage, so we actually is an initiative that hasn't been launched yet because it's been two years actually of thinking of um, um, a lot of discussions on how we should do that and, and set the stage a bit on this, uh, on this. But what we'll do is communicate and showcase these uh, local level initiatives, share knowledge among professionals, but develop solutions and empower stakeholders to be actors of change in the local level. So first, we, we had to spend a lot, find a lot of time <laughs> discussing of what is sustainability, what is sustainable and fair food systems. And we came with these five pillars. It's all, of course, um, coming from the guidelines, the SDGs and all this, but we wanted to be more concrete on the value chain things. And <clears throat> it talked about food sovereignty, quality and health. Um, it talks about fair livelihoods and fair trade. This is a, one of a very important component. It talks about local development, inclusive governance, and social cohesion. It talks about traditional ecological knowledge and its complement complementarity to the scientific knowledge. And of course, the low environmental impact. This is, of course, very important, but as you see, it's not the only. Um, and, and from the low environmental impact, we, we're not just talking about um, status of the stocks and so on. We talk about a lot of issues that might try to address this, like, um, I don't know, the carbon footprints, the, the use of plastic, the et cetera, et cetera. No? So a lot of things. 
it was very difficult to arrive to only 10 core values. <laughs> we first draw of uh, values yeah. in a list of, already? Okay. <laughs> 15 uh, core values, but finally we came with all this. And you will see it in the website with uh, this scan. <laughs> and then we developed some tools. From all of these core values that we developed, we tried to um, put some indicators on how to address these different indicators uh, into and how we're addressed. So this could be working as a kind of a self-diagnosis for every producer. Um, and it will have uh, a gradient from zero to three, being like three, like the ideal or more uh, advanced and so on. And this was done for, this is for the fish production, but also was done for, um, for cattle, for example, for these, or for even for the restaurants, because everyone has to have their own responsibility, not only the production system, but also the restaurant uh, section and so on. Anyway, um, so who is part of the COP? Um, basically, it's all around the small producers, feature farmers, that build a connected environment of um, community supported fisheries schemes with chefs and restaurants, but maybe other um, actors as well that could endorse a bit their, their work, like NGOs, for example, local NGOs that would support, or multidisciplinary scientists that would support it with their, their work. Etc. Uh, rural women, women in fisheries, etc. So this is going to be like communities in different places um, to build these connections, and we just basically tested a bit the uh, approach <laughs> in those different sites, uh, being the ones that you see uh, in, with uh, those labels uh, on fisheries. The rest are on cake, on cattle, or, or other uh, mm. food systems. <clears throat> Um, so I wanted to just finish with uh, an example so you can imagine a bit what I'm talking about. So this is the, um, the scheme of Empesquet. Um, this is uh, from Catalonia. There's a group of fishers that they were very far away from, from the closest auction. Um, and in the auction, they saw that their, their prices were very low, also because they were arriving um, the latest into the, into the market. And also because there was a lot of volume uh, fished, and so the, the prices were low. Um, also, Spain, you have to see that uh, forbids the direct marketing, so you cannot sell directly to the consumer. Uh, you have to be, you have to have a status for for doing that. On the other side, there was a young generation of people, of fishers, with a lot of energy that wanted to do things, but had somehow faced low prospects of future. And somehow they engaged in best practice. They were members of life and they, they were also part of different exchanges and so on from um, many uh, organizations. And they found that they wanted to address this issue on, on the marketing and they founded Investcat, which is kind of actually a direct marketing scheme to be able to sell legally <laughs> uh, their fish in a, in a more differentiated approach. Oops. I don't know what I did. Oh. Okay, so first, what they want, they had to do is build this internal ethic code of voluntary best practice and formal management measures. So first, they had voluntary best practice that they did from their own. Um, the project is actually the project that they tried to recover um, the the cuttlefish eggs um, that they were catching in their nests and they were putting back at sea. This time also finally led to, to form um, the management committee in Catalonia of the Cuttlefish, which actually Eva is the secretary. So, <laughs> and there there were also regulations that they were um, to recover their fishery. They have been um, mm -hmm. also adopting voluntary Ikejime um, certification um, and they are in a protected area. Okay. <laughs> So finally, they had this ethical code, and they um, actually did some advocacy to actually do a first sale in in, in La Stardid, which was not allowed. But they finally uh, made um, the administration allowed to do a pilot case for one year. 
they and then they set all these answer cards, which I'm saying here like very fast, but this take a lot of time because from moving from being just fishers to be um, business <laughs> and entrepreneurs, it's a it's a huge gap, and it's the key issue to here, no? Uh, but they managed to set their own price that actually buy their own fish, and then they set it to um, a contract system. So they do it with the stable price. They don't flow with the market. And actually, in parallel, because otherwise it didn't work, they had to build, build this community of practice of clients that actually understand and the needs and the shared values uh, among among this. So the the results could be this, the sustainability, the feasibility, the fair price. But actually what I'm seeing more is that they are very happy. <laughs> they just launched it this summer and you see their smile and they just say, I'm very happy because the selling their fish normally was the thing that I didn't like to do. Of course, receiving the money, of course, but I, and now they say, I'm now being able to enjoy this uh, very much and see that this is valued and it arrives to people that actually cares about our fish. So this is a bit finish. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> We've got Marco Constantini. Marco is the Regional Fishing Project Manager at the WWF's Mediterranean Program, which is part of the Marine Initiative of the WWF. Marco is a fisheries biologist with a strong background in MBA management and conservation biology. So Marco can talk to us about good management. I'll start the meanwhile. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Brian. I'm trying to condensate my presentation in order to be short. And I'll give you the floor then to, to my colleague who is online and WWF Queens. So I have some pictures with some pages of fishes. Some of them most likely you know them. Uh, well, uh, since I want to be short before entering into the presentation, I'll start with a conclusion. <laughs> uh, so the conclusion is that co-management is a tool. We, we all know that. And in the context of the Mediterranean, if we leave Spain and Catalonia on a corner, they are, they are the outlier. You know, they're the, the ones that are uh, the exception that is confirming the rule. Okay, so if we keep Spain and Catalonia on a corner, I would say that co-management is the only way that all the other countries can adopt in order to implement action in the field to support the implementation of the regional plan of action, as I said, because in reality, the laws that are in, in place at the moment to manage most of fishers are laws that can manage small cat fisher to a scale that is not the scale that the original plan of action on SSF is asking. So let's enter into the regional plan of action on SSF. Okay, you have seen already several times the list of the of the key pillars of the uh, of the SSF. When we decide, we all the stakeholders, because the regional plan of action on SSF was developed through. Uh, the sharing of the information. And we all could to have the participation of small scale fishery in decision making process. That was a key element. We wanted co management, to be honest, that time. But uh, the, the member of the GFCM, so the country, preferred the participation. But at the moment, uh, let's look at the European seas, the multiannual plan for the Western Mediterranean, for example, that is the one in place, or the one in the Adriatic that are focused on species that are targeted by small scale fishers, but small scale fishers are not included into the, into the process. No? The, 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 all the decision is made through the interaction between the countries and the, and the controllers, although the target species are the same. Well, now it's, there's a little bit things changing in the Western Mediterranean, but it's, we are really, really at the beginning. So uh, many organizations demonstrated that the, the, the um, uh, asking the, the small scale fisher to be part of the decision making process is very relevant because we obtain several good results in several countries, and I can see here faces that uh, know what uh, what uh, what I'm saying. The in the Mediterranean. 
the situation we have to look at, well, I'm WWF, so I have to point a little bit to the fact that there is an ecological crisis at the moment. And some of the question I posed this morning to the, to the speakers is exactly about uh, the status of the stocks. And uh, uh, the point is that the stocks, so the biodiversity and the fishes co-evoluted in the Mediterranean. And what is taking place now is biting both sides. Huh? It's biting the fisher and it's biting the, the biodiversity. What is important to take into account is that there is another factor that we are experiencing every day, that is the climate change. And climate change is having an impact. I don't know if you know those fish, but this is the famous puffer fish coming from the Indian Ocean, the one that is full of poison. And is, there are nets that are full of those fish in certain areas of the Mediterranean. So in this context, uh, there are many, many examples of co-management with a different degree of formalization. Very formalized in Catalonia, less formalized in Tunisia, but, but working with the same approach. And this is the map where we, WWF, are working in participatory processes and co-management uh, with the different offices and together also with the members of the, of the Friends of SSF. I'm showing this map not because of the, uh, to show, well, WWF is invading the, the rest of the Mediterranean, but to show you that there are some olds, you know? see Libya, Egypt, and part also of the Middle East that is not yet and enter into this, uh, enter into this complex. Meanwhile, Tunisia and Algeria and, Morocco is, is not yet there, but they are also going into this, into this direction. Well, what is important, taking into account the map and taking into account the fact that there are the Friends of SSF and most of the Friends of SSF are here today, is that we have to identify the way to scale up good results. Hmm? For example, from Catalonia to, or to Spain, to France, the mechanism, to replicate the success. This is, this is key. And at the beginning, the actors in this, with the idea to replicate were only the NGOs, but now it's no more the case. And this meeting is clearly telling us that it's no more that case. There are many, many other actors entering into the idea of promoting uh, co-management. And uh, this is a scheme that we are adopting and we are sharing with you that is, is a scheme to replicate the success. We talk about scaling out, scaling up, and scaling deep. The scaling out is by replicating the success. So we'll fishers from, uh, we move the fishers from the first, the first meeting was with fishers from France to Catalonia or uh, now we are uh, it, or organizing these exchanges with many fishers. The second one is the scaling by embedding co-management into national and regional action and policy and legislation. And my colleagues after me will talk about this. It's a quite boring, but very important things. We need law about co-management. If we don't have decrees, we will never end up in having co-management in place. The last one, uh, is the scaling deep by building capacity. And that is the SSF forum. And this is these, these event is the participation of the event, uh, of the fishers in these events. So to catalyze the implementation of the regional plan of action, co-management rep representatives are already participating in events organized by the Friends of SSF, are implementing field, field work and are contributing to legal, to legal policy work. And I will show you some examples. Don't be worried about all these words. This is about what we have done. I'm saying we because Raquel is here. She, she was with me. And uh, there was the SSF summit before the FAO events. There were officials coming from more than 20 countries around the world. We organized a session on the Mediterranean. Fishers from Tunisia shares their opinion with fishers and fisherwomen from, uh, from uh, Spain and so on. And the, the point, the key key points uh, identify 
through that um, through that meeting, entering into an official position that was presented at the FAO coffee. The FAO coffee is the committee officially, it's the most relevant and important uh, uh, point um, meeting of the, the in fishery policy. And I can share with you, I don't know if some others were inside, that the US delegation talked about co-management. That was quite impressive. Well, field work. Field work, these four bullet points are about four impact stories that we published, are about activities done in the in our in some of our field sites. The first one is about uh, fishers in Croatia that are releasing uh, Norway lobster with eggs because they think that it's very important to release those species rather than selling the products uh, to the market and taking into account these that is legal selling the, the, the females with eggs. The second one is about uh, a co-management in Porto Cesare in Italy. They are working with uh, small scale fishers to create more value from a very low value species. They created fish meatballs. The third one is about Telashita in Croatia. They work on a, a similar system to the one from, uh, presented by, by Marta. And so they put, they put together fishing tourism, uh, plus the local farmers, plus a blue business incubator to develop, the, to try to use the available uh, European maritime fishery funds to promote alternative livelihood. And the last one is about the, the, the lionfish. The lionfish is invading the Mediterranean at the moment. And we are working with small scale fishers in Turkey to teach those other small scale fishers how to clean and how to sell the lionfish. Because the lionfish compared to the rabbit fish, some years ago, the rabbit fish arrived. And then I don't know if you taste it, but it's awful, right? It's really old, huh? at least for me. But the, 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 but the lionfish is good. And so it's a new market, but they need to know that, to know how to, how to manage the, the lionfish. So some picture, this is uh, Shime. I'm sorry, this the, the slime. This is Shime releasing. Uh, the scampi with the eggs. We are used about fish releasing releasing sea turtles, but this is a, is a scampi, a Norwegian lobster. The, these are Yelen and uh, his husband on the boats. Uh, they transform their SSF boat to, to make small scale uh, fishing tourism. The last one is about a fisher exchange to my friend Sassi from Tunisia. We were in Turkey and the, the two uh, with the lady, with a fisherwoman, talking about how these invasive species were uh, changing their, their world. This is my presentation. I did as fast as possible, Brian. Uh, I, will, yeah, I will give now the floor to my colleague, Sofia Copela. You can introduce her if you want. And Very good. So thank you, Marco. Great. Sophia Coppella, who's going to talk now, is the is the main policy officer at WW Greece. Sophia has a background in environmental and maritime law. So Sophia, I think the floor is yours once our technical expert has thought of you out. Thank you very much. It's it's a great pleasure being able to join this very interesting session even remotely. Um, I'm a lawyer. Um, Marco said that law is boring. I don't find law boring. I think actually it's the basis for lots of things happening in terms actually of protection of the environment and fisheries management. So the focus of my presentation today as a follow up to what Marco has just said is the legal perspectives in terms of endorsing and implementing fisheries co-management. So I uh, will refer first to the role of law in promoting fisheries co-management. I will be outlining some of the key elements during the lawmaking process. I will be make a very short presentation of two very important recent legislations in uh, Europe, uh, the Catalonian and the Portuguese decree, so that we can see how the law has been uh, applied in practice. And finally, I'm going to make some conclusions based on the work that we have done in Greece on promoting co-management 
through a legal proposal. So all the work that I will be, all the information I will be presenting today is based on the research that uh, we have done at WWF Greece uh, for the promotion of fisheries co-management. So as uh, Marco, but other uh, participants have said, uh, one of the important actions in the regional plan of action for SSF is the promotion of participative management systems such as co-management bodies and the participation generally of fishers in decision-making processes. And as noted by many authors, but also people who um, work on co-management, the first pillar for successful co-management implementation is the existence of enabling legislation and policies. But first, before discussing the role of law in promoting fisheries co-management, we have to define what co-management is. And there is no specific accepted definition, but I like this definition by Gutierrez because it identifies the key issues that the law has to come and address in legislation. So fisheries co-management is a suit of arrangements, different type of arrangements with different degrees of power sharing. So power sharing is another important element, allowing joint decision making by the state and user groups for, a specific, for specific resources or an area. Um, and this is what the law tries to do. It tries to clarify, consolidate, um, it provides authority, legitimacy, prescriptiveness, legal certainty, and clarity in terms of advancing all these different elements of co-management. For example, establishing and consolidating the arrangements and the decision-making procedures, specifying the roles and responsibilities and the degree of power sharing. It allows and facilitates the meaningful participation of stakeholders, and also it ensures the implementation, and this is the element of prescriptiveness of the outcomes of the decision making process. What is important in terms of lawmaking, this is the legislative process, it's developing the law before it's enacted. It's important that the development and enactment of the legislation is based itself on a participatory process. So it has to be based on meaningful consultation with all stakeholders. All stakeholders need to have input in terms actually of what the elements of the legislation need to be. And these elements that need to be taken into account and decided upon during this process of lawmaking are indicatively, of course, the following. We need to take into account the national legal system and the potential restrictions that the legal framework poses. Uh, for example, in Greece, an important uh, constraint is the legislation on fishers' representation. So we need to make sure before we proceed with, uh, with um, legislating in terms of fisheries co-management to see whether other parts of legislation need to be, uh, be amended or whether they can be amended in order to facilitate fisheries co-management. In some cases, for example, there might be restrictions from the constitution or from other parts of legislation. We need to ensure actually that these constraints are put aside. The second question is what kind of approach type of co-management is more appropriate for the national circumstances? Uh, different types of co-management or participatory management have been identified by uh, state practice in academic literature, etc. consultative, collaborative, delegated. This needs to be decided upon. Uh, this, the other question is, what is the system, the tool that we want to endorse in the legislation? Is it an agreement, a plan, a committee or a council, or is it a combination of these different tools? What's the level of participatory decision making? The national, regional, local, depending, of course, on the focus of co-management. Are we going to be referring to whole fisheries, multiple fisheries, area specific or species specific management schemes? So this needs to be decided upon. What are the, the, the stage and the tasks in the management process that co-management will come and will contribute? Is it the planning, the development of the management measures, the implementation, the evaluation, the monitoring? So again, this needs to be decided. And what are the actors that are going to be 
um, and will be participated in the co-management systems. And you see an issue here is, of course, we want an inclusive system, but we have to take into account transaction costs associated with this multi-level stakeholder system. Within the policy context, because the law is not enough, we need the framework within which the law operates. There are certain parameters that we have to take into account when deciding on these questions that I have just raised. We have to take into account the political, the economic, the social, the cultural and historical context. For example, in terms actually of the historical context, we need to take into account whether there is existing practice in terms of fisheries co-management. If there is existing practice, whether this needs to be facilitated in the legislation, but also the legislation needs to be flexible enough in order to accommodate for other type of practices that might be necessary in, in, in order to implement fisheries co-management. What's the post? So the position of stakeholders, there's political will, commitment of authorities, and of course, the issue of empowerment of fishers. This is an important element of effective participation and resources and funding. To what extent the, 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 the uh, allocation of resources and the funding needs to be integrated in the law or with, whether this can be provided in the uh, general framework, policy framework. Um, Apart from these general uh, issues, we have also examined, and I want to share with you some of the information that we have gathered. Um, we need to look into examples of legislation of how of co, of co, how co-management have has been applied in practice in some states in terms of legislation. So this is the you can see on the screens the decree in 2018 of Catalonia and the decree the Portuguese decree, which was enacted in 2020. And just briefly, just to give you an idea of the different types of legislation and the different types of co-management systems applied in practice, um, the Catalonian decree establishes a framework for the governance of the co-management of activities, which relies on two interlinked pillars. The first is the establishment of management plans, and the second is the co-management model as a decision-making instrument. And you can see that there are different provisions for each one of them. In terms of the co-management com committees, there are specific provisions with respect to the composition, the operation, the responsibilities, the structure. It provides for four different uh, bodies, the presidency, the, uh, the secretariat, the plenum, and the technical committee. Um, and what I would like to focus, because we don't have much time and I'm aware of, um, of the time, is the process of approving a management plan, which is also the process for establishing a, um, a co-management committee. So the process starts in a unique, in, in, a, in a joint way, the, um, the director general decides to initiate a process for the approval of a management plan. And at the same time, it establishes an ad hoc co-management co committee for working on developing this um, management plan, but also it's the committee that's going to be in charge of the implementation, the practical implementation of the management plan. So, um, the, this is done by a joint um, order, and then the technical committee drafts a management plan. It opens this management plan for consultations with all members of the co-management committee, but also other entities. And there might be also a report for the, from the Ministry of Environment with respect to protected areas. The, the management, the draft management plan is submitted to the plenum. The plenum is the plenary body of the co-management committee. Uh, if the plenum does not approve, it sends it back to the technical committee with instructions in terms of uh, making changes. If the uh, plenum approves the management, the draft management plan, it submits the management plan to the competent governmental department of the government of Catalonia, and then this is enacted into an order. Um, there is also an option what happens if this process takes more than 18 months. If, if this is the case, then the director general is empowered to start the process without the co-management committee. There are seven, of course, I mean, you're aware of the situation in Catalonia, it's very famous. There are seven co-management committees already established and there are um, four management plans uh, that have been um, issued. 
Portugal is a bit of a different situation. That's why I, why I chose these two countries just to demonstrate the difference in the legislation. Uh, you see an overview of the different provisions. It provides a definition of co-management. It it's, um, provides that uh, the co-management is operationalized through the creation of committees. But the committees are created in a different way. And this is, sorry, this is the key difference between Portugal and Catalonia. So the procedure for setting up a co-management committee is started by the stakeholders, including the governmental authorities, that they make a proposal to the competent authorities for the establishment of the co-management committee. And the co-management committee is established by ordinance um, under the condition that it has the agreement of 75% of the holders of licenses allocated to the fishery uh, that's uh, that, 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 that's uh, being um, conducted in the specific area. So it's the it's this order that also provides for the the statute, the internal regulation of this committee, and also it determines the fisheries and the fishing areas. Um, the the law also provides for the mission and competence of the co-management committee. What are the responsibilities? And you can see also that similarly to Catalonia, it provides a broad spectrum in terms of the responsibilities, approval of the management plan, monitoring, communication of incidents of non-compliance, so uh, also a responsibility in terms of the implementation. The other difference mm -hmm. there with Catalonia. Can you shop, please? We're yes, of course, it's my, my pre-final slides. So sorry, of course. So the, the other difference with Catalonia is the fact that the competent authorities have discretion in terms of approving or not approving the proposal made by the co-management committee. So if the, the government does not uh, opposes, does not accept the, 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 uh, the management plan suggested, they need to inform the co-management committee of the reasons. And what we did in Greece, we took all this information that I just presented to you and the research that we did. We analyzed the legal framework, the best practice in other countries, including academic literature. We had discussion with various stakeholders, national authorities, scientists, fishermen, et cetera. And we have developed a proposal on how to integrate co-management in fisheries legislation in Greece. So, and you can see the proposal on the right-hand side. I'm not going to go into that, but it's, it's, it, it relies on the existing legal framework and also uses some of the ideas of the legal framework of uh, some of the countries that we have analyzed. This proposal is going to be the basis for the discussion with stakeholders. So we've submitted to the ministry, we've uh, sent it to fisheries associations, to other stakeholders, and on the basis of the feedback and the discussions we're going to have with all the stakeholders, we're going to develop a legislative proposal which uh, reflects in the best way both the obligations, the, the, the commitments of Greece in terms of the implementation of the regional plan of action, but also sorry, but also but also the national circumstances. Sorry, I, I, I went beyond my time. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have. Thank you. Next we have uh Reza Nabo, who is the Fisher Management Officer of Penzan. And being a mentoring wide network for managing the marine protected areas. So, Red's going to talk about co management of marine protected areas. So, over to you, Red. Uh, thank you, everybody, for this uh, opportunity to, to exchange. So, I'm working to uh, in the MedPan network which is a human network of MP managers uh, in the Mediterranean. And you can see some of them just here on the picture. So my, uh, my main job is to uh, maintain the MapaMed database, which is the database of all the uh, MPAs of the Mediterranean. So this is the map. Uh, you can see it and you can uh, see and download the data on the website on mapamed.org. And I will share my presentation so you will have all the links. Uh, we have a map and we have also the, the story. So you can see uh, on the left axis the number of MPAs created each year. And on the right axis, the coverage of the Mediterranean Sea that uh, each MPA uh, represents. So I won't take a lot of time on, on this slide because there is a lot to say about that. But 
you, you will be able to uh, to see it again on my on my slide. And uh, every four years, we are we do um, like a big uh, uh, state of play of uh, what's happening on the Mediterranean Sea. And we can see that uh, in four years, from 2016 to 2020, uh, we came from 6.3% of the MPA to 8.3, so we, we gained two points. Uh, but if you only take into account the no-go, no-take, or no-fishing zones, it's only 0.04%, and uh, it did not change uh, in four years. So. There is some work to do. And to end with this uh, very quick overview of the NPS on the MED, there is a huge gap between uh, Europe and non-European countries, uh, because I, as you can see, uh, most of the area covered by NPS is uh, in Euro European waters. And in the MAPAMED database, you can also find different kind of uh, data. For example, this is about the management plan because uh, you can have a decree uh, which created officially an NPA, but you have to implement this NPA. Um, as you can see on the left uh, circle, we, we didn't add the, the information for a lot of NPAs, but NPAs have different kind of uh, uh, of area. There are small ones, big ones, and there is a lot of overlapping between MPAs. So if you look at the circle on the right, you can see that the, when we consider the surface of the MPAs, we have much more information of what's happening. So we could do better, but there is still uh, some good uh, examples of uh, well-managed MPAs in the MED. And also, uh, each four years, as I said, we, we have to, to make this, uh, this state of play and we, we do a very big uh, online survey to uh, uh, retrieve um, as much data we can about the, the management state. And this is uh, the information we get about fishery management plans. So as you can see, you, we lack of data, but um, it is quite interesting to observe what's happening here because we could think that MPAs are lacking of uh, fisheries management plans. But uh, there is, if you if you look only the, the five MPAs that that say that they only have a management plan for um, um, professional fisheries. They also said that they have no um, major or high, or high level of pressure from the recreational fisheries. And at the other time, the other MPAs having only a management plan regarding recreational fisheries said they have no problem with uh, professional fisheries. So it's not always relevant to have a fishery management plan depending on the context. Uh, but if you look at the, the last part, we, we get 55 MPAs saying that uh, they don't have any fisheries management plan. And 21 of them also declared that they have medium or high level of pressure from fisheries. So this one should have a fishery management plan. But on the, of the, at the end, I think it's not so bad. <laughs> so it's quite encouraging. This is novel information about the regulation uh, about fisheries in the in the Med. Uh, so we dis we distinguished uh, four kinds of uh, fisheries: the small scale fisheries, over professional, the spear fishing, and over recreational fishing activities. And for each of uh, these different categories, we distinguish the Europe and non-Europe MPAs. And as you can see. The MPAs outside the Europe uh, waters um, seems to have much stronger regulation. You can also see that professional fisheries and spear fishing tends to be very uh, strongly um, regulated inside the MPAs. Uh, but we we can also see that there is a lot of uh, of cases where the fisheries are regulated. And I think it's very important because 
I think co-management is maybe hiding be, uh, between this, uh, these numbers. So we had some question about uh, this co-management and as we, we could uh, uh, saw in the previous slide, it's quite a complicated topic. So we decided to make it quite simple. So we distinguished the co-management stricto sensu where stakeholders can contribute to the decision making and the consultation when they can contribute to discussion but they do not participate uh, in decision making. And we can see that's quite good because most of the MPAs have a kind of a system of co-management, but could be better because uh, it is mainly a consultation process and not a decision-making process. And we ask MPA managers uh, who say they have a, a co-management system, how things are, are going. And we can see that the daily work of an MPA manager should be quite tricky because <laughs> it's not uh, excellent most of the time. So we, we understand that they have to be on the field to, to, uh, to speak with the people. And uh, it's very important. Uh, it's a very important work to do, to build the trust between the different stakeholders. And this is... Um, Another uh, another example of uh, the composition of the governance councils uh, on the MPAs. Um, so most of the time there is public administration that are part of a, of a council. That's not a surprise, but you can see that professional fishermen are quite often uh, included uh, in the governance councils. Recreational fisheries much less, but quite interesting. Interesting to. Uh, uh, to see this uh, this fact, and uh, I'm over with data for for today. But uh, just wanted to say that Medpan also uh, is into action and provides uh, some management tools for NP managers. For example, on the left you can see a methodological guide for NP managers uh, to monitor fisheries. And on the right is an example of a scientific review uh, on co-management and MPAs. So you can find these uh, documents on the different links. I will share them with you. And uh, also we, uh, we are working on a regular training program. We have different MPAs, uh, which are uh, partners. And we were well, the first uh, training uh, in Porco National Park about getting started characterized fishing activities to help MP managers to uh, understand uh, what's happening with uh, fisheries in the MPA. And we also have another one, uh, Gokova Bay in Turkey, uh, which was very uh, interesting about co-management. Uh, and we we had managers uh, from all, all, all over the meds coming to this uh, to this training. Me, Rita, and I'd they like have to, ask to... You, you know, try and come yes. to the conclusion. Thanks very much. Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> so they have to bring two people, one man, one MPA manager and one fisher. And they came by couple to uh, to work together, to learn from each other. And it was a very interesting moment because they could come back and MPA manager could uh, share what they learned with their team. And the fishers also could uh, share this with uh, their colleagues. So that's all for me. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, the Senor Juan Sparrow Bordiglio, who is going to talk to us about Imela, which is the chairperson about stakeholder policy in the case from data collection to decision making. Mr. Juan has a degree in biology. 1984, he's the national president of the Acti Agrital, the Association Generale Cooperativa Italiana di Settori Agrofittico Alimentare, which I suppose is something to do with agricultural and fishing cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And he's been the president of the Veterinarian Advisory Council, the, uh, sorry, 2013. So without more ado, over to you, Senor 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for this section. Uh, I think uh, many of you uh, already know the role of MEDAC, that it is to give uh, to European Commission uh, and uh, Union member states advice and technical solution and suggestion to facilitate the achievement of uh, common fishery policy objectives. And this also on the uh, request of member states alone or for the joint recommendation. How our, our structure, the structure of MEDAC, sees the participation of national or international association and organization of professional fishers who work both in industrial and small scale fishery NGOs, trade unions, women association, recreational sector, and member states, institution, participate assiduously in our work and experts for, from scientific community are often invited. Our uh, work plan is agreed with the DG Mare and see the annually and see the activation of uh, five working groups and five focus groups and the participation of which is open to all members. In compliance with the uh, European rules, uh, the organs of MEDAC are composed for 60% of uh, representative uh, of fishery and 40% uh, of, from uh, other interest groups. And with this composition, we arrive always at the, we are obliged to arrive to share the advice uh, between the two groups, sometimes including minority statements. So concerning uh, MEDAC involvement in the EU decision process, it must be clear that uh, advisory council uh, are not management bodies. Their role is uh, to just to give advice to uh, EC and member states. And uh, though for uh, our composition, our job is very similar to the one of co-management bodies that Marco Costantini described you before. We give our advice when on the base of scientific information, they, the commission are preparing, commission or member states, they are preparing proposal of management measures. Uh, also in relation with the uh, recommendation, the proposal of European Commission uh, at uh, GFCM uh, site. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, in fact a door for to the decision making process for small scale fishery that are present in our members. Of course, the MEDAC approach promotes the importance of the uh, participatory method in fisheries policy. So the bottom up instead of the common and control. And this to have inclusion and cooperation of fishers and the stakeholders in the implementation of management measures. We have established a panel of scientific experts regularly consulted to help steering the discussion in uh, uh, ex uh, executive committee, in working groups and in focus groups in uh, all the topics. So uh, the current scientific expert involvement in the uh, MEDAC activity, uh, as, as you can see, uh, is uh, about recreational field series, the demersal and pelagic species, ecosystem approach, etc. So about the consultation uh, on the main issues related to the sustainable development of small scale fishery sector. On the end of June, the MEDAC and the Friends of uh, Small Scale Fishery organized a, a workshop uh, in uh, Rome to analyze the forthcoming management measure of GS, uh, at the GFCM level uh, of interest of small scale fishery, of course, and provide shared stakeholders advice on the basis of the available information. And this is related to three points. The first is the data collection of social economic data covering small scale fishery characteristics. The second is the relation, the interaction between small scale fishery and recreational fishery. And the third one is the implementation 
of the uh, uh, regional plan of action about the small scale fishery. The workshop uh, has been uh, held in presence uh, and around 20 stakeholders coming from extra EU countries couldn't attend the meeting. And so now they provide their contribution through a, a written procedure that is just in progress in these days. So for the, for the, first, for the first point, the data collection of socioeconomic data, this is the draft proposal uh, from MEDAC that uh, the topics had to be considered. It goes from trend to a total number of vessel, of active vessel uh, per country, per uh, subregion, the percentage of inactive vessel on the total of country, uh, average age of vessel, trend of fishing days in the Med Sea, trend of fishing days per country, trend of catches per unit of effort, trend of landing value, landings value per country, employee cost, trend of crew. Uh, trend of uh, a number of full-time equivalent and uh, trend of for the crew per country. All I these. Think I think we can see the slide. We're going to be able to have the slides afterwards. So if you could just go through the main points of your slides. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So uh, for the second point uh, is the interaction uh, with the uh, recreate, uh, recreational fishery. And we are discussing about the uh, six species, uh, about uh, which we have to uh, uh, decide to, to, to arrive to a common advice uh, between uh, about the management options uh, and the inclusion uh, in multi-annual plans for these uh, species that are, that are of interest in recreational fishery and is mosquito fishery. And the third one, the third point is uh, uh, about the implementation of regional uh, plan of action for small scale fishery. And uh, the, the group has to discuss about the value chain, capacity building, decent work, rule of women, and climate, climate and environment uh, impact about the change uh, in, uh, um, in our environment. Well, about these topics, uh, we are waiting to have uh, for, for your contribution. And uh, I, I hope to have uh, a lot of contribution for our written procedure to arrive to a common advice uh, about this important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good. Very, very, good. very good. So we now come to the end of our session. It's exactly five o'clock according to my watch. I think what I would propose is take a short break now and keep question answer interaction until the next session. So there's going to be a follow-on session from this, which means that we've got Akatea presented by Katia and the women from Actea who are going to discuss who they are, what they do, and the importance of uh, gender and women in the Mediterranean. And then we have someone presenting on the value chain. And then we'll have opportunity for some interaction question afterwards. And we'll also conclude. So now we have 15 minutes to have a break and get back and get set up for the next round. Thank you very much.